As I said, I'm the director for Domain 2 of the Outcomes Framework, and I'll try and explain what that means to you as I progress. I'm going to talk about the context, the challenges, and the enablers around long-term conditions. And I'm going to start where we should always start, with the patient. And these are three not atypical cases that are challenging the NHS at the moment. Andy, a young diabetic who's about to transition from child to adult services. A paper published from Oxford on children transitioning from uh, renal transplant services to adult transplant services. 25% of the children lost their transplant in that transition. Then we've got Errol, mental health problems and physical health problems. And yet, it's predicted that Errol will have a chance of dying 25 years prematurely compared with the rest of the population because we do not treat people with mental, serious mental health problems holistically. We need to treat mental and physical health on a par and um, in both patients with predominantly mental health problems and those with physical health problems. And then of course we have the challenge of an elderly widow living alone, family moved away, she's becoming forgetful, she's becoming frail, um, and um, she has a couple of comorbidities. And sometimes long-term conditions are synergistic, but often they're non-synergistic, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So what are we trying to do with NHS England, the domains, and the quality framework? Well, right at the top of this pyramid is we want to deliver high quality care for all. So what do we mean by that? Well, we took Darcy's definition of safe, effective care providing a positive patient experience. And then we wanted to be able to measure it. So we broke it down into five domains, three of which are pre break down the effectiveness component. So can we stop people from dying prematurely? Can we enhance the quality of life for people if they have long-term conditions? And can we, if people do have to be admitted to hospital for acute care or with trauma, make sure that they recover quickly and safely? And can we provide that positive patient experience and safe care? And it is about what that means for the patients. Will they feel supported? Will it be organized around them as people? Will they be in control? Will they get the best possible treatment? Will they be treated with compassion, dignity, and respect? Will they feel safe? And will we work on the feedback they give us to continually improve the services? And the way we're trying to do this in the domains is to work as a team. Because we see we need to role model the need in the community, in the health system, in the care system, for people to work as teams. So Mike Richards has been working in Domain 1, but very closely with me on how we prevent people from dying, but also then improve community and social care, and then working with Keith Willett around how we re-able people, and making sure that Mike Durkin and Neil Churchill, who lead on safety and patient experience, their work is absolutely like a piece of rock, is right through everything we do. So it is this one vision for quality, one ambition, one purpose to the NHS, but then how we deliver it and how we measure it and how we work as a team. So the challenges, the really big challenges facing us now are the demographic changes, multimorbidity, the fact we can do more and more for people now. The fact that society's expectations have changed. And finally, we've been hit with the biggest economic crisis for many decades. So we've lived through a golden era of year-on-year -year increase in funding. That has stopped. It won't come back for a number of years. Live with it. Long-term conditions are not just a challenge for England, not just a challenge for Britain, but they are now the biggest challenge facing health systems worldwide. Go and look at the Global Burden of Disease publication in The Lancet last year. 50%, half of all GP appointments, two-thirds of outpatient appointments, 70% of inpatient beds. 
and around 70% of total health and care spend on long-term conditions. But also the big change is long-term conditions are now hunting in packs. So what do we have to do? We've actually got to change the way we interact with people who have long-term conditions. On average, we see, as professionals, we see people with long-term conditions for about five hours a year. Might seem longer to some of you. They live with it 365 days a year. We need to empower patients and their carers. We need to reconcile the population versus the individual interest. At the end of the century, Derek Wanless went around the world looking at what's the best way to fund the health system. And he came back and said, the way we're doing it now in the UK. A risk pool. But that means we have to be cognizant that we have a finite resource. We have to use it to best effect for a population as well as the individuals in front of us. And we need to reorientate the system to the big, growing, emerging challenge of multimorbidity. Team working, information, technology, and incentives. And we need to make sure we actually deploy our investments to best effect. We understand the value of what we're doing. And on evidence, absolutely we need to use the best evidence available to us. But let's remember that most of the evidence is predicated on two things. One, excluding anyone over the age of 65, and two, excluding anyone with comorbidities from the study. We're working with NICE now to look at how do we deal with comorbidities when the evidence wasn't designed to address that particular problem. And also there's this agenda of quaternary care protecting people from gratuitous interventions and treatment, which probably isn't necessary. And that's a big challenge. Have we over-medicalized the system? So going back to the value proposition, we roughly have about £2,000 per head of population. And this is a very rough calculation taken from my old job of how much we invested in the key components of healthcare. About £170 goes into primary care, £330 into community and mental health, £1,000 into the acute sector, and £500 into specialised commissioning. Now, that gets locked down year on year. And for the last, for the, up to 2010, we'd had growth year on year. That stopped. So if the acute sector overspends by 4%, just 4%, doesn't sound too bad. Look at the gearing in the system, because you're going to have to take it from somewhere else in the system. And 4% of acute care spend taken out of primary care, do the maths yourself. What about if primary care, community and mental health worked in a coherent, consistent and coordinated fashion? Could you take 4% out of the acute sector? And what would that mean in terms of investing for sustainability in, in primary care, community and mental health? Think about it. And where should our focus be? Well, this is a slide about activity and cost. And if you just look at the activity side, you'd say, well, we need to focus on first outpatients and follow-up referrals, because that's where all the activity is happening. But look at the cost of those two in the acute sector. You're going to have to take a lot of referrals out of the system to have a financial impact. Well, you don't want to focus on this, do you? Because it's only a tiny bit of activity until you look at the gearing. That's the cost of emergency admissions in an acute trust, over 50%. So the old Kaiser mantra that emergency admissions are a failure of the system might be now best said that emergency admissions will cause the system to fail. And this is where I believe passionately, having worked in both the acute sector and general practice and commissioning, that clinical commissioning groups bring us a huge opportunity to work with their member practices to build and commission care, integrated care around them, the generalist support, which I'll come on to, to address this huge problem around long-term conditions. We have the registered list. 
we have the experience and the everywhere, if you look at the evidence, if you build good, strong general practice, you get better value in the system. And we need to use clinical commissioning to drive forward on this agenda. And we need to build it around what the patients want. This is what we heard from National Voices. They want care that is planned with people who work together to understand me and my carers put me in control and coordinate and deliver services to achieve my best outcomes. Patient activation. How many times do we ask, what do you want as a result from me offering you care as a health and care service? So to do that, we're using a metaphor to build the house of care, which will deliver person-centered coordinated care, commissioning, engaged and informed patients, healthcare professionals committed to partnership working, and organizational and clinical processes. Let me take you through that. Commissioning is a quality improvement cycle. It is not just contracting and procurement. It is about understanding needs, working with providers and the public to design care to meet the needs, and going through procuring, monitoring, and evaluation. Think of it as a quality improvement cycle. Build on that by in the roof of the house of care, using the best practice we have to hand. We know that implementing nice guidance, quality standards improves care. We know that adopting lean processes improves care. Let's use that and drive that forward. But let's also build the pillars which create a space for the person at the center of this. And we need to empower patients and carers. We need to listen to them. We need to ask them what they want, what their needs are, and how we can deliver against their goals. And we need to support professional collaboration. Great paper in the BMJ last year on multimorbidity, talking about continuity of care, which said three components, informational continuity, the information about me as a patient is available wherever I go with professionals, and go out there, there are all sorts of apps which can now make that a reality. Give the information, it's a patient record, the clues in the word. Um, the second is management continuity, which is how we build the house of care around people. And the third is relational continuity, that they have a trusted advisor to turn to when they need help. I don't know about you, but I've probably used my smartphone a dozen times today and it's really helped me, it's given me information, it's reminded me of things, I've communicated with it. We need to embrace the potential of the digital era to support us to deliver this challenge. Giving people information, receiving their feedback, and integrating their care using, I mean, I don't know how many of you don't do digital banking now, but I don't, can't remember the last time I went into a bank to do that. If banks can move my money around safely, he crosses his fingers, then we need to do the same. But give the patients the ownership of that record. We need to use the triple therapy of risk stratification so we understand the population need and commission, this is from Newark and Sherwood CCG, so we commission the right services, make sure you've got the right services to deliver for the population and against their needs. And then we need to build that professional collaboration. Let's stop talking about primary and secondary and community care. Let's talk about generalist and specialist care. We need to build the generalist platform, which is at the center of this, building around the registered list, building community wards, virtual wards, whatever you like to call them, and then pulling specialist help the clues in the title, consultants, in to help and support the generalists, but also allowing direct access where appropriate, straight through if somebody has a single condition or complex problems. So my role is not to tell CCGs, not to tell social care, not to tell health and well-being boards, but to try and help create insight, understanding, influence across the system, generate the right inputs so we can deliver the right impact for people with long-term conditions. And so you'll see many of these things. You'll have seen them coming out in bits and bobs. 
But think about it. The stuff that we've been doing about um, access to records, shared decision making, care planning, choice, personal health budgets, put that together, that's about empowering patients. Working with primary care to liberate primary care, using, joint, using health and well-being boards, strategy, tariffs, currency, the common purpose framework, the integrated care pilots, all through commissioning to help build the house of care. Clinical and organizational processes, the NICE guidelines and quality standards, NHSIQ, strategic clinical networks, and our professional collaboration, um, interoperability, again it comes back to the IT agenda, creating the right financial incentives. Our financial incentives are all geared for planned care. They're not geared for long-term conditions. We don't want money to follow the patient if they're going to the wrong place. And we need to have shared outcomes across health and social care. I personally believe one of the biggest breakthroughs is when we have a shared number between health and social care so we can track information, where our investment is made, how it benefits both systems. So at the end of the day, Oxford introduced a proper transition coordination process for their renal transplant patients. Not one child moving to adulthood lost a kidney once they'd implemented that process. We need to make sure we give, we treat mental health on a par with physical health and we reintegrate physical and mental health and stop seeing them as two completely distinct and separate systems. And we need to look after Beatrice and provide the best possible care for the older population because um, they deserve it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think there's time for 10 minutes of questions. So I'm going to take them uh, as singles, I think, if that's okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> Shall we start at the front then? <laughs> Hang on. I think you've got a microphone coming. You talk about patient choice. Mm. Um, everyone in this room is a patient, whether you're a healthcare professional or not. We know we're all patients. How do you ensure that Beatrice is treated the same, whether she lives in Oxford, Blackpool, Nottingham, or wherever she lives, and everyone's choice is the same throughout the country? Um, well, I don't. Let's be realistic about this. Um, I think that um, uh, there will be differences. So Barnsley, Birmingham, and Barnstable have completely different problems. What I can't do is dictate a magic bullet which says everything will be uniform so everyone will have a black door. But I think it's about we need to have the NHS outcomes framework, the NHS constitution and the mandate which set the expectations, the, the goals and the outcomes we should be delivering for people. How you get there if you live in, you know, Mablethorpe in Lincolnshire compared with Hounslow in London will be different and there will be differences so you can't say that there will be a one-size-fits-all but I think it's that's why we need to change this from a process focus to an outcomes focus and listen to what people are telling us if Beatrice living in Mablethorpe is getting a bad outcome we should hear about it and be able to change things that give her a good outcome and ditto in Hounslow, but how we do that might differ per force of circumstances. Rural and remote areas differ greatly from urban city centres. So I'm not going to I'm not going to pretend that it, you know I think we can always have the same for everyone everywhere, but we must strive to try and deliver the same outcomes for everyone. Next door, next to the mic. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, very much agree with the approach that you're advocating and the quality of care in primary and community care. Of course, that then uh, very usefully leads you into disinvesting in the acute trust. Um, and as commissioners, of course, that can be quite a challenging and locally politically sensitive issue. Any thoughts about yeah. that disinvestment? Strong and, thoughts. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to do it. So how do we do it? Well, you don't do it without working with the providers. You won't do it in a confrontational way. 
Now, I was in Camden CCG the other day talking to um, one of the CCG leads there and the work they've been doing. I worked in Lincolnshire um, on redesigning um, services there. And you, you know, the power is in doing it with providers. Um, so this way it comes back to commissioning is not a transactional process of contracting and procurement. It is a dynamic quality improvement process. Build the local relationships. It you know, changes about people. And unless we work collaboratively, so if I'm a chief executive of a trust, what's gonna kill me? What's gonna kill me is people suddenly piling up at my A&E, not being able to admit them, and then not being able to discharge them once I have been able to admit them. So if you work, so they need to know that there is a coherent and consistent, safe, effective platform for patients to move into the community on which will be a long-term change so they can safely close wards and create that disinvestment. So we have to work in partnership, we have to work as a system. And I truly believe that because long-term conditions tend to be in communities, the health and well-being board, CCGs, public health, local providers work, gives us a massive opportunity, but it ain't easy. Should we just take that one? Thank you. Um, really impressive vision about the generalist and specialist care. And you've spoken about the acute issue there. What, would you, what, what are the three things you would do about changing primary care into generalist care fit for purpose? OK. The first thing is I would do and, um, is create space to think and come together. We need to um, invest to change to save. OK. So we need to use CPD, we need to use any weapons we can, any levers we can to bring people together, to work together, to, sh uh, to share um, their experiences, their knowledge, and make change happen. The second thing we need to do is we need to measure. So we need to capture information, we need to provide feedback um, so that people can see that change is happening. And um, I guess the third thing is, uh, we need courage. Um, so we need to support people. And also, I think we need to, um, if you haven't read Tim Harford's book, Why Every Success is Preceded by Failure, then I would read it. Um, I can speak with great personal experience on that matter. My mistakes have been my biggest learning and have led to my biggest successes. So we need to celebrate failure once. Failing twice um, is not acceptable. Good point. There's a chap here in front. Uh, hello. Uh, you wisely uh, alluded about the uh, ethos of partnership between the primary and secondary care, uh, without which uh, I, I don't think uh, this vision will be able to be fulfilled. But I don't know how many of our secondary care colleagues are present here in, under this roof, uh, and how do you persuade them to come on the board because they okay. don't understand, I, at least in our area, we don't seem to have any, uh, un, uh, the, our, our secondary colleagues, care colleagues understand this. I, I hear you, and so the first thing, and what I've seen time and time again as I go around the country, seeing really good examples is CCGs, general practice, community and mental health services getting their act together first and actually showing that they are a force, they are a good force to be reckoned with. And then going to the specialists and going, look, we can give you that platform now. We can work with you. We can help you deal with your problems in the acute sector. Keith Willett has this thing where he says, says to GPs, who are your patients in conversation? And people have said back to him, well, the ones I see in surgery, the ones in the nursing, you know, the ones come in, you know, he says, what about the ones in hospital? Oh, no, they belong to the specialists. Well, they don't. They're your patients. And then he goes to the consultants, and he says, who are your patients? They say, well, one we see an outpatient, one we see on the ward. What about all those out there? Oh, well, they belong to the GPs. No, they don't. That's where we need to bring consultants, as I said before, the clues in the name, to help quality improvement and work collaboratively with generalists to support them to really deliver the changes we need around long-term condition management. But first of all, 
take the pl I would say to CCGs and primary care generalists, take the plank out of your own eye first. Let's get organized, let's create that coherent, consistent platform, then let's go and engage and say to the specialists, we're ready for you now, because we can provide what you need to change your services radically. Sorry, there was somebody at the back. Yeah, last question, yeah. yeah. Uh, I heard the lecture was very good and very informative. Was there any, uh, because you are pro giving more work to the GPs, but where are the incentives and where the fin financial burden on the GPs, how to provide everything? Okay. And hang on, hang on. And could you give us some, I know you, you are not giving any leaflets. Could you give us any main point to say these are for the GP to do this, this, this? Because in, within half an hour, I don't think I can uh, retain more than 30%. I don't know about the rest. Thank you. Okay, a uh, lot of questions built in there. The real driver, I would say, is look what's happened to investment in general practice over the last five years. The acute sector has been invested in, general practice has been disinvested in, community services have been disinvested in. That gearing in the system is happening. Everyone thinks they have ring fence budgets. There is only £2,000 per head of population. So one of the big things is the incentive will be if we don't engage with this agenda, the money's going to get sucked into that cent the acute sector whether we like it or not. And I think that we're all on a burning platform, so we need to mobilize. I also think that um, there are good examples, NHSIQ, there are examples around the country which we need to share and support you in of how people have tackled these challenges and changed their practice. So doctor first, the Productive General Practice Series, um, real, real tools to help general practice, community services, mental health services, to change the way that they run their services to create that time and space to deal with this agenda. I'm under no illusion about how hard it is. I worked in general practice myself. I know the demands on the service and how hard it is, but we made changes and it improved the way that we were. I talked to the GPs in Newark and Sherwood, I talked to Kaz yesterday in Camden. Instead of seeing, doing 14 home visits, once they set that system, that sort of virtual ward system up, they were doing one a year to patients who, were expect, who previously had huge demands on general practice. So we can make changes which will help professionals deliver a better job. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Absolutely fantastic. Um, we'll, uh Finish it there, unfortunately. Happy to take questions outside. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.